What is it like over there? So um, <clears throat> I think in, in the global news, there's a lot about, you know, the politicians meeting. Uh, the last few days, you know, there have been these kind of uh, meetings of the president of France with Putin, uh, the, the chancellor of Germany with Biden, uh, the president of France, Germany and Poland meeting in Berlin uh, yesterday. Uh, uh, the prime minister of England, Boris Johnson was, was in Kyiv. So there's this kind of diplomacy happening. There's also reports on the military uh, buildup, which continues. Uh, there's uh, uh, the kind of the Russian military buildup has created a horseshoe around Ukraine. So uh, there's Russian forces in Belarus, and they're beginning, I think, tomorrow, 10 days of exercises, uh, joint Russian-Belarusian uh, exercises which could very well be, you know, kind of exercises to prepare for invasion. There's uh, on the east side where the Russian-led uh, separatist movement has been waging a war for eight years, that's built up. And then in Crimea from the south, uh, there's a lot of forces built up in Crimea and there's naval forces in, in the Black Sea. Uh, and it's probably about 100,000, 150,000 troops uh, in, in, in total. Um, at the same time, uh, the Ukrainian forces have been uh, strengthening. There's a lot of, um, there's a whole program for civil defense uh, units uh, to be created in different cities. So civilians, and uh, veterans are, are um, being um, organized and trained and eventually they will be armed uh, in case there is an invasion into Ukraine. I think there's between 150 and 200,000 Ukrainian troops uh, in different formations, whether it's the army, the Navy, the Air Force, uh, the National Guard, um, and there's weaponized uh, security forces, so up to 200,000 troops. And there's also 400,000 veterans of this war. Uh, so on the military side, uh, there uh, clearly uh, the Russian military budget is probably 10 times as high as the Ukrainian military budget. Uh, and its army is, you know, maybe, maybe also seven or eight times as big. Um, and of course, it has more, more, uh, more weapons. Uh, but um, it, that indicates that, you know, in the country, there's kind of three different parts of the attitude. What surprises many um, that come to Ukraine and see things up close is that citizens aren't panicking. There's kind of a stoic uh, attitude. Well, you know, we've had a terrible 20th century, 15 million people in the country were killed in the 20th century through world wars and totalitarianism, both Nazi and especially communist. Um, we've had eight years of war. So this, what is kind of the big um, blockbuster story for the global community has been part of our history and part of our experience for the last eight years. A lot of young people, kids, teenagers, they don't remember their country not being at war, not being under invasion. So a lot of people, they're not, you know, kind of shocked uh, in a sense, uh, surprised by what is happening. Although stoicism is accompanied with, uh, you know, quite a bit of apprehension because uh, the people who know war and Ukrainians have had 14,000 people killed uh, over the 18, eight years, 
they realized that uh, a massive invasion would be tens of thousands of people killed and many people maimed. The two um, regions of Ukraine that are partially occupied in the east and Crimea, which has been annexed, the war in the east and an annexation has led to at least 1.5 uh, million internal refugees. So if let's say five or eight more regions came to be occupied, there could be three, four, maybe five million more refugees. Uh, and this, this would be a flood into the remaining part of Ukraine, but it would spill way over into Western Europe. And if, if um, you know, Germany received 1 million Syrian refugees and that caused a major social and political shakeup, uh, three to five million refugees from Ukraine would create a tremendous uh, social political uh, problem for the whole European Union. Uh, and, and so there is that kind of apprehension. And there is, you know, a resolve. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, President Putin has unified uh, Ukrainians in kind of a patriotic stance. Uh, Russian speaking Ukrainians, uh, people, uh, of course, Ukrainian speaking Ukrainians, people of different religious backgrounds. They have come to enjoy and uh, cherish uh, the civic liberties that Ukraine has. Ukraine has free elections, it has freedom of the press. Uh, you can express yourselves publicly. Uh, all, all ideas are out there in, you know, in the civic discourse. Uh, and they know that's not possible in, in Russia. People are free to move. Uh, people are, are free to make choices in their lives. And this is something after 30 years that people don't want to give up and they're willing to fight for it. And many are willing to die for it. Not all, some will flee. Uh, uh, some will stand firm. Some are signing up you know, for military service or for these uh, civil defense um, units. Now, the war is not only a military war, it's a hybrid war. And what is happening and has been happening is that different ways are being used to destabilize uh, this democracy, uh, which, you know, has a kind of a, a liberal qualities to it. It's a liberal society. Uh, it's, it's a society where, you know, people don't worry that somebody will hear what they say, which is not the case in Belarus, where, you know, the dissent was repressed brutally uh, last year. It's not the case in Kazakhstan, where hundreds were killed just in the past few weeks, and it's clearly not the case in Russia. Uh, so uh, the Russian authorities uh, have, been trying to destabilize Ukraine as a state, as a society, by cyber attacks. Uh, January 14th, there was kind of a big cyber attack at uh, government websites. Um, the economy is, over these last eight years of war, has been under attack. Although the economy is, in recent years uh, in Ukraine, shown growth and positive development. And uh, for example, uh, in the month of January, as this military mil buildup has been progressing around Ukraine in that horseshoe shape, uh, one way of really trying to rattle society and create panic is that there have been uh, upwards to a thousand bomb threats, uh, many of them directed at schools. Uh, coming as uh, emails uh, from um, the occupied area of Ukraine in the east, from Crimea or from Russia or Belarus itself. So in the city of Lviv, which is kind of like Boston or San Francisco, 
metropolitan area of about a million people with over 100,000 university students, uh, you know, very culturally important, uh, not, not the political or economic center, but uh, culturally very important city. Um, all of the schools have been evacuated three times because of bomb threats. And you can imagine what this does to families, you know, parents of children whose kids are rushed out onto the street have to drop everything at work and take their kids home. Uh, the kids' children are crying, wondering what's happening, the you know, first time, second time, third time. So there have been a thousand of these um, uh, bomb threats, false bomb threats, thank God that they're false. But this is just one way in which uh, a hybrid war is waged. It's, it's, there's a psychological war. There's an information war. Uh, there's, uh, you know, this, um, it's kind of having a gun to your head. You've had a gun to your head for eight years because of the war, but now from three different sides of the country, north, west, and south, there's these barrels being pointed at uh, every citizen in the country. And that, that, you know, is exhausting. This is combined with, you know, a peak of the COVID um, uh, pandemic. Uh, the hospitals are overfilled. Uh, they're, they're overflowing. And in some wards, there's only one doctor and one nurse for 60 patients. Uh, so, you know, medicine is being exhausted. Fortunately, this is the Omicron uh, version, mostly. Uh, and um, uh, so there's a lesser percentage of people are in, in, in critical condition, but the ICUs are filled, the hospitals are filled, and uh, the medical system and the doctors are really exhausted. Um, I've um, had a chance to feel a little bit of this because I've, I, I caught COVID myself, I'm coming out of it. Um, I didn't have you know, severe symptoms. I didn't need to be hospitalized. I had uh, three vaccinations, but because um, so many people are sick, uh, the, the, many people who are sick aren't even being tested. So uh, the official statistics are, are grossly uh, underestimated. Uh, they're, they're underestimating what, what really is going on. Uh, I find the resilience, uh, the fortitude, uh, the resolve of the people, uh, the faith of the people very, very strong. I spoke with a, with a priest that, uh, a bishop actually, uh, who's a good friend of mine. Uh, we had a longer conversation last night. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, he returned, uh, three weeks ago, he returned, three or four weeks ago, he returned from um, serving at the front. Uh, Christmas uh, in Ukraine is according to the old calendar, so it was January 7th. And uh, he, he was really moved at the faith of the people um, uh, in the villages uh, near the front. They said, we're not going anywhere and we're not going to, you know, abandon our faith. We really hope in, in the Lord. Uh, he, he visited and served at military units, um, you know, heard a lot of confessions uh, and it was really bolstered by uh, the, the strength, the spiritual strength of uh, both the soldiers and uh, the citizens in that front, front area. Has there been an increase in church attendance and prayer gatherings, an increase in conversions? It's, it's hard to uh, uh, judge uh, statistically because uh, there, uh, of course, is, uh, you know, a desire for the faith and uh, a need for it. But there also is the uh, spike in um, uh, the COVID situation. So COVID keeps a lot of people uh, away from uh, services, uh, but um, there was quite a participation in um, 
the prayer uh, call for prayer that Pope Francis uh, shared with uh, the global community on January 26th. It was a big prayer marathon uh, with, um, it was during the day, during the work day from nine to nine on Wednesday, January 26, two weeks ago. Um, apparently about half a million people participated in that. I was one uh, of them. I watched it online. <laughs> did you? You saw it online. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for those prayers. Uh, I was in London and, uh, you know, uh, Archbishop of Westminster, the Cardinal, you know, showed up and two archbishops and a couple bishops at like a moment's notice because it was all organized within the last 24 or 48 hours. Um, people were encouraged uh, by that. Uh, today, the Holy Father uh, renewed the call for prayer in uh, uh, I, I don't know the exact word he used, but it, that he said that, you know, the, the prospects of this invasion are, are, you know, basically insane. You know, people in different parts of the country are packing uh, refugee suitcases just to be, all, to be ready to move. Uh, I think yesterday, a lot of the Canadian uh, embassies, um, non-essential staff was moved out. The American non-essential staff was moved out earlier. Uh, and that actually, when that was announced, that sh sent a, kind of a shockwave through through the country. If the diplomats in Kiev are moving out, uh, uh, this is, you know, the threat is very serious. Um, I'm in a city in Western Ukraine, which is probably about 800 miles away from the front. And if Ukraine were to be occupied, this is, you know, the last place. Uh, that that would be occupied. Also, the resistance here would be ferocious. Um, um, but uh, a lot of people from central Ukraine, from the capital, are renting apartments here uh, to move. And uh, talking with the business community, I know that uh, you know this threat of escalation has really it stopped construction in many places in eastern Ukraine. Um, you know, the work, remodeling work, the kind of work that, uh, um, you know, is normally part of business uh, is, is slowed down. Orders for businesses are, are slowing down or stopping. Uh, so this threat really hits the economy. It hits, you know, people's livelihood. And I don't know if I mentioned it in, in our conversation last time, but the war and the, the cyber attacks, the attacks at, at the Ukrainian economy uh, from Russia eight years ago um, deflated uh, or inflated the Ukrainian currency. It lost, it lost two thirds of its value. Uh, so a dollar was eight hryvnias in 213 and 214, it, it became 25 hryvnias. Mm. So the purchasing power of people's salary uh, plummeted, and which which uh, contributed to uh, a continuous uh, exodus of uh, people searching for work in in Western Europe. There's now probably over three million um, Uk Ukrainians in the European Union uh, that that have have uh, you know gone to Ukraine over over the last I mean it's probably been a 20 year process but in in the last decade and especially after the war that process has has continued and been accelerating has that been a brain drain taking away the top is, professionals of course. yep top professionals uh, and often the professionals leave you know let's say school teachers or doctors or nurses, they leave and they do menial work. You know, they work, men work construction and, 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 and women are au pairs or take care of, you know, old people um, in, in, in various European countries. Um, so that, that kind of, you know, unsettling of society, this, this, dislocation uh, and yet and yet there's no panic you know people are not uh, 
are not, uh, you know, trying to hoard, to hoarding, for example, uh, groceries or, or other, you know, supplies. None of that is evident, and I, I find it really quite, quite striking. At, at His beatitude had said that the church was a sign of hope amidst all of this. Yes. And that is, that is what the church is trying to do, to, to preach hope. Um, uh, the uh, kind of the position of, I, I met with uh, last week with all of the bishops of Ukraine. They, they had a synod and I was invited to participate. And um, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, uh, the permanent synod of our uh, church is meeting. So we have about 52 bishops that meet once a year, but there's kind of like the executive committee, uh, the four bishops that advise the head of the church, and I'm, I'm a member of that. And uh, we have our meetings. Uh, I was supposed to be with the head of the church in Kiev, but because I got COVID, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't go there. Um, but uh, the meetings are occurring online. And uh, the position of uh, the church leadership is that everybody stays in place. The bishops, and the priests, they stay in place. Nobody leaves. Nobody flees. No matter what happens, uh, the clergy, um, the, the pastors are going to stay with the flock. Um, and um, the, the pastors are, are being encouraged to develop mechanisms of communicating with their flock, just in case the internet is knocked out in case other means of communication, telephone are knocked out, develop ways of communicating with the flock. And uh, the, the, the priests are um, developing ways of communicating with their bishops so that parishes will be preserved and that you know, the parishes as constituents of diocese will also you know, kind of uh, make sure that the diocese can function. Excellent. I had a question regarding the coverage, since you are so well versed in both sides of the, you know, media coverage here, the, the coverage in Ukraine and also the coverage over here. Are there any kind of gaps that you see in what the West, what information the West is receiving now? Are there any misperceptions? Again, it shifts day by day. And some have interpreted that, you know, as you said, that stoicism and apprehension is a sense of it's really not that bad. I mean, I have actually heard people say, well, it can't be that bad if they're not worried about it, which talk a little bit about, you know, some of the possible disjuncts there, if any. Yeah, well, you know, uh, people who lived the Soviet experience and the post-Soviet experience uh, are not softies. They don't, you know, there's a lot of things uh, in much of the world that many Americans, you know, can't tolerate. You know, we've got air conditioning, and, you know, if there's a few degrees too, too hot and, you know, uh, all our heating and our humidifiers and 59 kinds of cream and all kinds of deodorants and, you know, uh, sprays for this and patches for that, uh, you know, most people in the world and most people in human history didn't have all that. And they have to deal with a lot less. And um, most people in Ukraine uh, can stand up to a lot of discomfort, uh, much more discomfort than you know, uh, people in today's uh, rather comfortable uh, and soft West. Uh, now, they're not masochists. They're not looking, you know, to suffer. But uh, the question is, you know, this is their, I mean, this is their home. These are their friends. This is their family. This is their houses. These are their schools, their churches. You don't just drop all that. Uh, there's allegiance. There's cohesion. There's, uh, and uh, Mr. Putin has, uh, ironically, he's fostered a lot of that. Uh, by, by this aggressive attitude, uh, you know, you, uh, you want to take away our freedoms? Well, you know, go and try. We're, we're not going to give them up um, easily. Uh, we've, our, our, our parents and grandparents and ancestors have struggled along for centuries to have independence. 
Uh, and the country voted 91% um, of the country supported independence in 1991 on December 1st. Uh, that referendum uh, really was the death knell of the Soviet Union. Uh, three and a half weeks later, the Soviet Union was declared null and void by Gorbachev on uh, December 25th, 1991, because Ukraine became independent. Um, Ukraine is the linchpin. Without, without Ukraine, Russia is really not an empire. And even though it has 11 time zones of land, uh, Putin wants this, this territory, he wants this, this population. Uh, and so this is not kind of the first time, it's in the historic memory. Um, many people have relatives who died for Ukraine's freedom. And over the last decades, uh, in different forms, uh, you know, people have had to consider what their freedom means. They, 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 they don't take it for granted. So uh, what the, the gaps in uh, the Western understanding is how bad you know, this war of the past eight years has been for millions of people. Um, yes, Ukrainians uh, you know, put one foot ahead of the other and life goes on. People get married, people you know, celebrate birthdays, uh, people have children and um, uh, you know, people raise toasts, they sing, they dance. But um, the war has been devastating for mil millions of people uh, have endured post-traumatic shock. Uh, you know, 14,000 have been killed, tens of thousands have been maimed, injured. And that really is not, you know, it's emerging now. There are, you know, on, on, in, in different uh, news, news outlets are now kind of, doing stories about what it's like in that zone. I mean, the, the zone that the Russians have occupied is not doing well. People are living miserably there. The, the Russian occupation in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions has brought misery to the people there. Uh, the, there there's lots of criminal gangs and there's poverty, destruction. In Crimea also, uh, there's, there's a lot of problems. Uh, Crimea gets it, its water from Ukraine, and that water has not been getting there. Uh, and it's just, you know, the, the, the Crimean Tatars, about uh, a quarter million uh, who were deported in, 19, in the mid-1940s by Stalin, they were allowed uh, at the end of the 80s and by independent Ukraine to come back to their ancestral homeland, ancestral homeland. And and they've been severely persecuted over these eight years. Their leaders have been arrested. Uh, some have disappeared. Uh, their cultural programs have been closed down. You know, their television stations, radios, publications. All Ukrainian schools in Crimea have been closed. Uh, so, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are suffering. And um, that that is not really understood. Um, hopefully, you know, I, I've been seeing just in the last few days more stories about this. But, you know, also churches, uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Crimea, <laughs> as well as the Ukrainian Catholic Church have suffered. Um, they're, 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 they're kind of being strangled. And, and, you know, the history is over the past 200 or 250 years, every time a piece of Ukraine comes under Russian occupation, sooner or later, it can take a year, it can take 10 years, it can take dec a few decades, but the Ukrainian Catholic Church is extinguished. And uh, that happened in the late 18th century, it happened in 1825, it happened in 1870. Uh, it happened during World War I. 
uh, and uh, in a very drastic way, it happened in 1946 when all the bishops were arrested and for the next 43 years, the Ukrainian Catholic Church was the biggest illegal church in the world. So people, people know what Russian occupation means, both historically and in, in, in recent years. But I don't think people in the West know what that means. Any that, final words here? Well, I, I just a, uh, a real expression of thanks to all who are in solidarity of prayer. We, we really trust in the Lord. Uh, the freedom of our church and the freedom of, of the nation 30 years ago was a miracle. The Soviet Union was armed to its teeth uh, with nuclear weapons. Nobody believed that you know you could you could somehow you know dismantle it, and it kind of fell apart. Uh, and people people became free. The church became free. We went from three hundred priests to three thousand priests. We have now three thousand priests uh, for four and a half million people. We have eight hundred seminarians. Can you imagine? It's incredible. For four and a half million uh, faithful, eight hundred seminarians. Uh, that's a miracle. And it's, it's a result of God's grace and the, the, the blood of martyrs and, you know, the, the prayers of little old ladies and families. And so we thank, thank everybody for the solidarity of prayer. We ask people to be informed. Don't, don't buy the propaganda. This is not about uh, a danger of, uh, you know, to Russia, some security issue. Ukraine is not attacking Russia, never has. Uh, the attacks are always in the other direction and sometimes they're genocidal. Uh, this is a question of democracy, of freedom, flourishing next to Russia and threatening the corrupt authoritarian regime. It's really light from Ukraine shine, shining into a dark, dark system. And darkness fears the light. So it wants to stamp out the light in Ukraine. That's, that's what is behind this aggression. Because aggression is always a fear. There's a fear behind aggression. People who are free and joyful, they're not aggressive. Uh, and third of all, um, there already is a humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. People have been impoverished. People have been injured, maimed. Uh, people are, suffer from post-traumatic shock. There's a shortage of medicines. And it could get much worse. So helping um, the charity uh, organizations, helping the church Charity arms is, is something that uh, um, is, is very important. And I think you have our um, web, uh, web um, link uh, for the fund that's established in Philadelphia um, at the Arch Eparchy, which will be distributed through, through the church's uh, charity works here in Ukraine through the bishops and through uh, the Caritas, which is the Ukrainian Catholic Charities, uh, who have been doing tremendous work uh, over, over these years of this war. Well, Archbishop, we just thank you so much. Could I ask for a quick prayer? And please know that you and the people of Ukraine remain in mind yeah. as well. May, may the Lord give peace to the world. May Lord, give strength to all who carry peace and who speak the truth. May the Lord keep America free and Ukraine free and all people free. May we recognize our dignity. We thank you, God, for creating us in your image and likeness. And we ask you to help us to maintain that dignity, to not fear, to have hope, to help the poor and the suffering, to speak the truth, to bless each other, and to live in your kingdom here and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Archbishop. God bless and keep you. 
We look forward to hearing from you again soon.